Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. So glad to see so many of you have made it out on a cold November evening in London. So thank you so much for coming. And we're here to talk about why gender equality is not just a women's issue, it benefits men too. And you're going to hear, after you've heard a few words from me, from our fantastic panel, um, we have Thomas Shamoro Premuzak, Professor of Business Psychology at Columbia University and University College Lon London, Chief Innovation Officer for the Manpower Group, and author of the absolutely fantastic book, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders? <laughs> if you'd like a taster of the book, he's also got a really excellent TED Talk that you can uh, look up. And Thomas is also on the Advisory Council of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership here at King's College. We have the wonderful Tommy Isaacs, Senior Director of UK Corporate Engagement at Catalyst, and Avi Khan, Member of the Executive Board uh, from Hilti Group. And of course, we've got my boss, Julia Gillard, the 27th Prime Minister of Australia and the Chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at, here at King's College. So just a few words from me before we move to the panel. Well, maybe not. Okay, Sophia, I've got a problem. <laughs> so. Sorry, everyone on the live stream. Okay. Yes, so why do we need to have this conversation? Well, first of all, notable minorities believe that efforts to address gender equality, inequality are in fact harming men. 15% of Brits think gender equality doesn't really exist, and more men hold this view than women. One in six think men have lost out in terms of economic, political, and social power um, as a result of feminism, with men three times more likely to think this than women. And three in 10 think that traditional masculinity is under threat today, with men twice as likely to feel this way as women. So why is it so important to involve men in this conversation? Well, internationally, around seven in 10 people think that women won't achieve equality in their country unless men take actions to support women too. And in Britain, 75% of women compared to 58% of men agree with that statement. Internationally, there's a notable minority of four in 10 who think men are being asked to do too much to support gender equality. Half of men felt this way compared to a third of women. And three in 10 people in Britain agree with that statement and men were more likely to feel that way than women. But frustratingly, we know from the research that men stand to benefit from gender equality as well as women. My colleague, Minna Cooper-Coles at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, undertook this report looking at the impact of women political leaders. And what she found is that when there are more women in politics, there's more emphasis on social issues, such as healthcare and education. When we have more women leaders, we tend to see more caring societies with lower mortality rates and higher rates of child immunization. Women leaders are also more likely to prioritise childcare than male leaders. And my colleagues Rose Cook and Laura Jones undertook this research looking at working parents, men and women, and flexibility and job quality. And what they found is that many men want to be more involved in, child care, in caring for their children, but they feel unable to do so because of the potential impact on their career. Research shows that fathers' involvement in childcare is good for children. It boosts their well-being, their academic achievement, and their cognitive development. It's good for fathers, increases their own sense of well-being. And it's good for society and future generations. Sons who have more involvement from their fathers when they're growing up, grow up to be more involved in their own children's lives too. And here are some examples of things that men have said in the report in the qualitative research that Laura and Rose undertook. And here's a man who works in higher education, a father who said, 
I think it gets very gendered in terms of my caring responsibilities. There's a lack of understanding of the role. I feel a lot more pressure to be present. It's an ongoing challenge for me to negotiate and make that work. So the assumption being that women do childcare and when men want to negotiate for flexible working, for example, it's not understood. Another man working in the charity sector, people don't talk about your children. When I ask for support from a manager, it's like, why? Where do you need to go? What do you need time off for? What is your priority? Can't your wife pick the kids up from school? So these are the issues men face when they want to be more involved in childcare. Um, and we're going to hear much more about how men can benefit from gender equality from our wonderful panel. Over to you. being here and thank you to Professor Rosie Campbell for getting us started. I think the mic's just come on in a startlingly loud way, so I'm sure you can all hear me. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. What we're going to do with the panel is dive in um, around reflections as to what you've just heard from Rosie and from the work that individuals do. We'll then have a conversation uh, amongst the panel, but we will be opening it up to you for some questions as well. So please be thinking of good questions if there are some threads that we don't pursue in the discussion that you are particularly interested in. Tommy, if I could start with you, just whatever you want to say based on your work with Catalyst, which I know um, has been uh, very profound and in your career before Catalyst, you were also centrally involved uh, in work around gender equality. But were you shocked by any of those statistics? And, you know, one thing that certainly stood out to me is we've got those statistics and yet at the same time, Rosie effectively concluded with some cries for help and recognition from men because they do want more flexibility, more ability to make life choices and not to have them confined by gender stereotypes. So how are you seeing that? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be on the panel today and for allowing Catalyst to be partners in this event. None of Rosie's findings actually were surprising, unfortunately. And I thought those quotes at the end were really quite powerful. Men do want to participate in gender equality initiatives. Um, just to give you one stat from uh, some research that we've done at Catalyst, um, we found that 86% of men want to interrupt sexism in the workplace, but only 31% uh, feel equipped to do so. Um, but before I go on, I just want to say that Catalyst has actually been doing, looking into engaging men um, for about, uh, since 2009. And we've, um, Abby's going to be talking about MARC, which stands for Men Advocating Real Change. Um, and this is a program that we, we implement and help organisations to um, get involved with engaging men effectively so they can be better gender champions in their organisations. Um, I'll stop there, but there's... Yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion. There's a lot to share. Thank you. Uh, Avi, do you want to pick up that thread and particularly the work you're doing uh, advocating change and how uh, difficult or easy it has been for you to get men involved in that work? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to, um, to pick up from there. Thank you for that and uh, thanks for including me in the panel. I think when I try to talk about this topic, I always divide it to the company because I represent an organization, a for-profit company, and then my personal side. So I work for a company that um, has been on this journey with Catalyst for almost a decade now. And the start for me was like any other person that works for an organization, more from a compliance standpoint. That's what the company is working on. We want to increase our gender diversity and I complied with it. It's only when I intended Mark and exactly as you said, on the one hand, it equips you with the tools to become that champion for change in your organization. But it really is for, for the men here or for the women that are looking for men allies. It really is a transformational experience. You can look at slides and the statistics are very powerful. It's really when you're confronted as a man with the realities that women face every day, that at least in my case, it turned me into a, a real champion for change. That's, I think, the, 
the power behind what Catalyst does and specifically uh, Mark. And do you see in that, I mean, you've been on your own journey, but working with uh, men in your business, do you see that shift, you know, is it resentful around compliance and what's the what's the journey from resentful around compliance to an enthusiast? Can you drill out some change factors there? Yeah, sure. I mean, you added the resentful. <laughs> I didn't say I was resentfully complying. <laughs> Not you, but <laughs> most but, uh, compliance tasks are taken with a certain slump shoulders kind of demeanor. Yeah, sure. I think that's a, that's a very fair observation. I think it's one thing to comply when the organization says we want to increase diversity it's a completely different thing to understand as was just shared in the opening actually it benefits all of us there are many catalyst quotes that i use on a regular basis one of them is when you build a great place great working place for women in the process you build a great working place for all including men it really uh, struck me when uh, you showed the quote on childcare because in our company and in many organizations that I'm aware of, when we took a look at our maternity leave and realized that we had to change it if we really wanted not only to attract women but to allow them to build a long-term career with us, it actually caused us to look at our paternity leave as well and to realize, one, it wasn't competitive, but second, if we really wanted to encourage men to take their time, it needed to be positioned in a different way exactly as you, you just earlier showed. So I think it's examples like that where um, men can see that they win as well. We can talk later about performance statistics that we have uh, in our own company on diverse teams that are led by inclusive leaders that actually perform significantly better. And of course, if you're part of a team that performs better, everybody wins in the process. Mm. And Thomas, let me bring you in here. Thank you for all the uh, support you give the Global Institute for Women's Leadership on our advisory council. We're very, very grateful for that. I think probably half the audience is thinking, uh, what is the answer to the question, why do we keep promoting incompetent men? Uh, I know you can't answer that in uh, two words, but you might want to weave from that to how you're seeing the uh, change agenda. How do we involve more men? How do we broaden understanding that gender equality is better for all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, also thanks for inviting me to be here. And uh, hi to everybody. And it's nice to see also many men in the audience, right? We should acknowledge this because I think that has changed. And at the level of organizations and institutions, um, there are more programs that have a component of men as allies, which results show really systematically or at least significantly improve the result of gender diversity and inclusion interventions. Um, but now to your question, I think, um, you know, um, I tend to focus a lot on the business case because I think when you focus on the moral case, which is obviously important, um, it can accidentally backfire because then people who are just focused on profits said, oh, you know, this is something that might uh, threaten or undermine meritocracy. And actually, focusing on the business case would improve the situation for women. Um, why is gender equality or why would gender parity or gender equality be good for men? Three main reasons. One, um, we know that estimates indicate that about Mm, the GDP of the world, so the global GDP, would increase by about $30 trillion a year if women had access to the same job opportunities that men have, right? Uh, about 180 countries in the world, so the majority of countries in the world, ban women, formally or legally, from doing certain jobs. This actually is an underestimate because it doesn't account for the second point, which is that getting more women in leadership roles would significantly elevate the quality of leadership. And as Avi just said, if you measure um, the effectiveness of uh, managers and leaders in terms of how well their teams performed, how what their levels of engagement, well-being, performance, uh, results, profitability, you can pick your KPIs, whatever you like, then that's a significant uh, add-on or additional increment in the performance of 
businesses, units, and organizations, institutions and nations, and of course, men are part of those teams as well. And finally, perhaps the one that is uh, rarely, rarely highlighted, um, acknowledging that there is um, uh, an advantage in having people lead in a more feminine way, People lead through compassion, empathy, kindness, consideration, self-awareness, humility, etc. Would also be good for many men who are currently overlooked for leadership roles or from leadership positions because they don't fit the you know archetypical macho style or masculine style of leadership. So you know, and I think those tend to be the men that also emerge as allies in uh, DNI programs. Mm. Um, so it's a win-win situation. Uh, Often when we get, you know, business people to listen to this argument and pay attention to the data, um, it, it creates a big cognitive dissonance. Because what they would historically like to say is that, you know, they want the best person to get the job, irrespective of whether they're male or female, to which I would say, wouldn't that be nice? But where is the evidence that that is happening, right? So if you actually point out that what's in place is anti-meritocratic, and they're supposed to be running a for-profit corporation, uh, it's a bit shock to the system. And Avi, you mentioned that you've drilled down into performance metrics team by team. Can you just talk to us about that and how the diversity, Thomas has obviously given us some sort of macro look, but at that more team-based within a business level, how do you measure and how do you persuade? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's great to hear it. We we love uh, and I personally appreciate the research uh, in the area. I think it's great that we can bring a real company example. So we run a global employee opinion survey every year. We ask our team a series of questions. Many companies do that. Over the last 10 years, we've increased the number of questions around diversity and inclusion to understand if we're making progress. So we have real numbers that we can use that create a basis to say, is the leader behaving in an inclusive way, or at least is their team and also their 360, their colleagues and supervisors, do they assess them as being inclusive? At the same time, we can look at the diversity, the gender diversity of the team, that's obviously one of the few things we can measure and report in the more than 100 countries that we operate, sometimes other um, of our diversity um, indicators that we'd like to measure, you can always ask and measure in countries. We would like to increase the awareness for mental health issues, for sexual orientation, but gender, at least there, we have a very good basis. And what we have found is the teams that are led by inclusive leaders so when we ask about behaviors in meetings and awareness to needs flexibility a series of questions around inclusiveness and are diverse so have at least 30 percent and i know that's low not to make any excuses but hilti is for those that don't know we're a supplier to the construction industry two-thirds of our team members so more than twenty thousand, are on construction job sites every day so many women in the crowd, that's probably not your dream career yet. By the time I'm done, I'm hoping it will be. But um, we still at least would like to see 30%. The higher it is combined with inclusion, the higher the performance of the team. As Thomas just said, you can pick many key performance indicators. We zoom in on sales growth because those are primarily sales frontline teams. And the evidence, I uh, really like the way you said it, is sometimes shocking to people. Diverse teams led by an uninclusive leader actually underperform. That's also very surprising mm -hmm. to people. But diverse teams with an inclusive leader, those are just the two ingredients. It's quite simple. The entire team overperforms, not just the women, not just the men. And of course, everybody benefits from that. And that's really what we've been trying to do, exactly what Thomas said, is not say that we're doing it to create a better world. Of course, we would like to, and not because we want to be better tomorrow than we are today, but we are a for-profit organization, and we really believe, and I personally believe, that increasing gender diversity at all levels, especially in leadership, will lead us to be a better performing company. So I'm going to come to you with the hardest question of all. Uh, I mean, given for what we've heard so far, you know, 
gender equality, men being involved in it, diversity at work, inclusive leadership. It's all sunny, uplit lands. You know, it's better for the global economy. It's better for the performance of individuals. It's better for the lives uh, of the uh, people who are engaged in those teams, in those workplaces. And yet, <laughs> and yet, uh, we get the statistics that uh, Rosie uh, and, and exposed to you at the start of this conversation. And we all know, wherever you're from, whether you're from this great university or you're from a workplace or a community organisation, that you're not working in a place of gender equality. So what what's going wrong? Have we not got the message out there the way we should have? Have we got the message out, but people are finding it hard to work out how to enact it in their workplace? Are people a bit interested, but struggling to have the words for the conversation? What do you think is going wrong? It's a great question. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, from our research, we've found that men actually face three key barriers to engaging in gender equality initiatives. The first one is apathy. So many men don't think it's, they don't have, they don't find an, a compelling problem in gender inequality. Um, it's HR's job, for instance, so they're completely disinterested, not interested there. The second, um, the second barrier is fear. So I can break that down in three ways. So men feel fear around making mistakes. They feel fear around um, loss of status. So if women do well, men don't do well, which is a zero-sum perspective, which the, as you've listened to these two gentlemen here, that's not the way. I, men do benefit greatly from gender equality. And, um, and actually also fear from disapproval from other men if you get involved in gender equality initiatives. And that's where the gender norms coming, and they're so powerful to really make men disengage and take away this opportunity that men have to actually improve uh, gender equality. Um, just to that point, actually, we've seen BCG's research around how 96 organisations that engage men 96% record progress on DEI initiatives versus 30% who don't engage men. So men are absolutely critical here. Um, and then the third reason, the third barrier that men face is ignorance. So 51% of um, men we spoke to are quite ignorant about this topic. And to Rosie's point, although it's not only men, 15% of people in the UK actually don't recognise that gender inequality is a problem. So that's something we absolutely have to sort of make clear because actually one of the predictors of people becoming aware and actually taking action against gender inequality is a sense of fairness that's really important and men often actually talk about wanting to level the playing field and act on meritocratic grounds so that's um, also very important i think the final point i'd like to make here actually there's more but one final point in this moment is um is that we need to make men feel welcome in this discussion you know, that's really important. They, I know it's a man's world, as the song says, but actually they do want to participate and given them more opportunities to do that and learn about this topic is so important for society, not just the workplaces, but for society, for society altogether. I'm going to ask you to reflect on those barriers, but it seems to me um, intuitively that... Um, ignorance and apathy might be easier to address than fear. Um, so, you know, they're, they're quintessentially explanation jobs, you know, why should you care? And if once we've got you caring, this is what you should do. But if men are holding themselves back because they fear they're going to make a mistake, they fear that they're going to miss out, uh, they fear the disapproval of other men, that seems to me quite a big uh, set of problems to, to shift. Does that resonate with, with you? Yeah, Please. I mean, maybe I can use myself as an example. When, uh, when we at Tilti started to make gender diversity a topic, actually, I didn't have the middle one that you described. The fear I didn't have. I was a young general manager running our Canadian organization, and I felt quite comfortable with how the company perceived me. I've been with Tilti now for almost 20 years. And so the fear really wasn't there. I really felt if I would advance women, there would be opportunities for me. There would be opportunities for them as well. I for sure had the other two. And that's why 
I believe so much in the mission of Catalyst as, in my opinion, the leading non-profit uh, organization addressing gender equality in the workplace, and why I'm such a big believer in Mark, as you shared, men advocating real change, because it really goes after these other two, which I suffered from. So the ignorance and the apathy for me go hand in hand, and I don't want to ruin the session for the many of you that I hope will take the time to join it. I think it's equally impactful for men and women. But there is a series of uh, experiences, of questions in the session that just confront you with the reality. And for me personally, it was so impactful that in one of the breaks, I had to immediately call my wife and ask her, are these are these situations true? Is this really the reality? So that shows you on the one hand, the deepness of my ignorance coming into that workshop, but it also immediately, at least for me, but also for many of the men in our organization that have since gone, I had the great opportunity to be the first person in our company to attend. It really created the apathy. And I don't even want to talk about the situations where we ask in the workshop, you ask every person, have you ever been uh, subject to comments that are inappropriate or sexual advances? And of course, every single woman raises their hand or steps forward. But questions like in business travel, did you ever feel unsafe? And not a single man steps forward and says, yeah, coming out of an elevator, I felt really uncomfortable that somebody else stepped out of the elevator on my floor and I'm watching which room they're going to, but every single woman does feel that way at one point. And it caused me to think, if you and I are traveling together to an interview, a real situation that's happened to me across my career, you're flying to another city, to a headquarters or whatever the setup may be. And the night before we both come out of that elevator and my heart is not racing on the way to my room, I'm not feeling that pressure. I'm just walking comfortably to my room and I got just an extra 10 or 20 or 30 minutes of sleep that night, and I, my mind was clear to prepare, I just had an advantage going into that interview. And there's nothing we can do about that, but we can create an environment where we compensate for that gap. We are, we are aware of that situation as a company and making sure we both have the same opportunity. I think that's the real impact of Mark. You're right, addressing fear is maybe more complicated. It touches our primal, mm. probably our most primal instinct to protect what we have. But I think already addressing ignorance and with that creating also apathy is a big step. That uh, It's amazing what you can achieve in a two-day workshop. Thank you. Thomas, what do you think? Well, I mean, I agree with all of that. And obviously, there's a lot of sexism in the world. And we understand that uh, incompetent men uh, have a lot to fear and worry about when it comes <laughs> to gender equality, especially because there's a lot of them in charge who got there on non-meritocratic grounds, right? But uh, I also think people who are um, formally and professionally, professionally and even on a full-time basis dedicating, get it, dedicating their careers to making things better often accidentally make them worse. And I think there is a little bit of a pervasive bias that actually contaminates and pollutes how we think about gender differences that impacts women as well. And if you look at the interventions that are still the dominant approach for trying to make things better, a lot of them really look like benevolent sexism to me. It's pointing the finger at women over and over again and telling them, you have to be more confident, you have to be more assertive, you have to apply for jobs even if you're not qualified, you have to speak in meetings even if you have nothing to say. It's all ridiculous, right? Because it's an attempt to actually try to make women, perhaps competent women, more like incompetent men. And the underlying assumption is that if men are in charge, it must be because they're somehow superior. So women need to emulate them. And when they do, they either lose because of the double, bi double bind situation and because they don't you know, fit the traditional uh, feminine gender role or gender archetype, or they outmail males in masculinity 
and they get to the top and then it all backfires because then everybody who was even on the fence of being maybe a little bit of sexist says, look what happens when we appoint women because you get the wrong women in charge. So I think, you know, we need to uh, do a better job with interventions. And yeah, it is. it might be fear of change, loss aversion, irrationality, a lot of biases, but it's not just men. I think it's the system as a whole. And I'm going to draw you in on reflections on that. So, uh, I mean, one of the things that we discuss a lot at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership is we're uh, not in the business of saying that we need to fix women, uh, that, you know, women need to somehow be changed. Uh, we're in the business of fixing uh, structures and stereotypes, so the more meaningful interventions. But how do we find our way to that conversation? given, I think, for a long time now, um, you know, businesses, community organisations have thought that if we, um, you know, make a few changes, perhaps we have a women's mentoring program, perhaps we send some of our high-performing women on uh, women's empowerment or women's leadership courses once a year, uh, and then they'll be, you know, more confident, more kick-ass, and then it'll all fix itself. Um, only to find that the statistics are stubborn, they don't move, we haven't created pathways for change. How, how do you see those interventions? What can we really meaningfully do? I think the first thing is to check our own biases. We all have them. And it's, as you were, I think as you were saying before, um, Tomas, it's, it's also about all genders checking their own biases. It's a team effort. You can't just expect men to sort of um, be interested independently. They have to be invited into the conversation. It's also about women checking our own biases as well. You know, when last did you say to a man, man up, or stop being so soft, or, you know, mummy's boy, and things like that? It starts from very early in life. So really thinking about those biases that are ingrained, that keep us very much sort of in these strictures of masculine and feminine norms which we're trying to break out of. And that's the opportunity that the clients we work with have with Mark. I'm not trying to advertise Mark here at all, but it is based on research. And we get into really honest dialogue about what the assumptions are and how we're interacting in the workplace and why things are the way they are. It's not the same in all communities and all workplaces, but they, we do, in our research, see quite a lot of um, commonalities. So. It's important to take that time to pause, have those conversations, men with other men, so they feel safe and they can really explore what masculinity is and unpack it in a safe space. But as Abby was saying, in Mark, we have 70% um, of men. We aim for that balance of 70% men and 30% um, women. So that's one thing that we can do to have these really important deep dialogues about what's happening. I think the other thing is about thinking about inclusive leadership um, without thinking about genders, but the behaviours we want to see. So once we've really looked at the gender biases and hopefully um, trying to work in a way that means that we're not defined by them, but we can choose them according to our values and really promote things like compassion, empathy in the workplace and humility, these are really important inclusive leadership skills that Abby was sort of touching on earlier. So having inclusive... Um, leaders is absolutely critical and making sure they get rewarded too. I think we reward the wrong things in the workplace quite often. So it's really important to celebrate those role models that are showing those behaviours that you want to see more of. Um, I also want to say that the workplace isn't working for anybody really. Um, the, in our research we saw that 94% of men suffer from masculine, masculine anxiety, which is around trying to conform to masculine norms. So um, I think one of the benefits of gender equality um, equal societies is about <coughs> giving men the freedom to choose how they want to express themselves. Um, and as a TIFF, I think we were talking about marriage statistics earlier, and men who take two weeks plus of paternity leave are more likely to stay married. So think about that <laughs> in the future. <coughs> but there is so much more I'd love to share, but I'll, I'll stop speaking. Can, can I just, um, just drill, drill in on two points that you've said? What's the, the, the science, the evidence behind curating groups that are 70% men and 30% women to get the conversation going? I think that's fascinating. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. 
And then what's the methodology you use to get to this um, statistic about um, men feeling um, anxious about stereotypes of masculinity? I think you said 90-something percent. Um, how do you get that out of the dialogue? Um, so the first question, the rationale around 70% men, 30% um, women, is to make men feel safe quite honestly, just giving them that safe space so they're not outnumbered, just to start with. And they're also, and we also, the facilitators that run MARC programs also ensure that the, the workshop norms are in place as well. So it's not about judgment, but it's really about unearthing a lot of assumptions that men have. So it's much more of a brave space where you can call out things rather than a safe space where fewer people want to talk because they don't want to have that judgment. So that's the rationale around the 70-30. Um, how we got to the 94% of men who suffer masculine anxiety, we asked them. <laughs> we surveyed them. And uh, we found out that that means that they, they have to work quite hard to live up to masculine norms. Be tough, show no chinks in your armor, get the work done at all costs. You know, working long hours because that's what's expected of men. So, um, and 22% of them actually feel it acutely. So they're the ones that are really, really anxious and trying to keep up with the masculine norms as well. So that came out of a survey. And is there any skew in your data based on age? Do older men feel differently about these things to younger men? That's a very good question. I don't know that off the top of my head, but speaking with younger men, they're far more in tune with their emotions. And older men also report that younger men find it easier to talk about their emotions. Mm. So that's what I can that's what I can share. Yeah, in, intuitively that feels right. Um, on on the better interventions, I mean, Thomas, you've obviously highlighted the ones that don't work. What does work, and then we might come to things you've seen work in your workplace. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm still an academic at heart, so it's a lot more enjoyable for me to point out mistakes. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, the book has a subtitle, which the publisher forced me to put, which is, and how to fix it. So there's maybe like a couple of pages in the solutions. <laughs> uh, but uh, actually, in a way, they're remarkably simple. It's follow the science and look for the qualities that make people better leaders, especially when they don't usually make them leaders. So select people on competence rather than confidence, integrity rather than charisma, and humility rather than narcissism. If you do that, you can be gender blind, you know, like a blind wine tasting. You don't have to see, and actually 60% of leaders would be female rather than male. Um, of course, philosophically, there are two ways to fix things. The hardest one is the sort of bottom-up way which is like the grassroots kind of, but each and one of you has a role to play. I mean, you know, you're not just sitting here and saying, oh, you're not spectators, right? Who, whoever you are and wherever you are, you have some power and you have some influence. So, you know, things are better now than they were 50 or 100 years ago, but it's also your responsibility to ensure that they're a little bit better in five or 10 years. But the French Revolution happens, you know, once every 200 years or so. So these kind of events, drastic kind of grassroots, but are not that common. So the top-down uh, process is way more effective. And so how do we fix it? I mean, it's fundamentally a leadership issue. Leadership, good leadership, should be an argument with the past. It should be an argument with tradition. So whether you are a male or a female leader, you shouldn't just perpetuate things as they have been the last 200 or 300 years. You should actually uh, drive positive change. And I think that's how change will happen in a truly Darwinian way, not the diluted or distorted bastardized interpretation of Darwin, which is like dog eat dogs, you know, Donald Trump-esque, the, the, the crookest person gets to the top, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of competition between teams, so if teams, by which I mean organizations, institutions, and nations, are run by more competent leaders, they will be more inclusive, and they will provide an environment for people who have historically been discriminated against and who have talents and merit to thrive. And those groups will outperform their competitors. So, you know, change will happen. 
So if it's slower in Australia than in Canada, then you expect for Canada to, you know, kind of increase the gap. If it's slower in Argentina than in Brazil, then Brazil will take and so on and so on and so on. But I think we all need to try to accelerate change, even if it will always happen to those who actually get it right and get it. Yeah, maybe I can can build on, on both these great comments. I think after you have this great experience at Mark, you're faced with uh, exactly what you're both talking about. You realize that uh, things aren't working. So what do you do? And in the business world, we have to be much more pragmatic and focus on the, the issues in front of us and how can we improve things? One of the programs I really like in uh, Catalyst is the Champion for Change CEO. So it really takes the highest leader in the organization. And if they're willing to, and it's really a growing list, I encourage you to look online, some of the best known brands in the world, it, the leader puts their name and their personal brand behind this issue. And then what can they do? Uh, as Thomas said, there's a lot of research on are really the best and most competent people being promoted. A very interesting research that Catalyst has put out, men are typically promoted based on the promise of their performance in the future. Women are promoted based on their performance of the past. So I fully agree with you. We shouldn't coach women to now uh, try to go for jobs that they maybe don't feel qualified for. But we do, that's what we believe at Hilti, we do need to give them the confidence that you are ready and you do deserve the opportunity for this role just like the man sitting next to you. And we believe that with mentorship and sponsorship, we can do that, but that requires specific intervention to assign uh, those relationships because probably not a big surprise, women are not as likely to step up and ask for that senior mentor and for sure not to develop that sponsorship uh, relationship. You also talked about that it's much harder to fix it grassroots. We're an organization that promotes 90% from within. We always look for that value alignment. We want to make sure that the people that we are assigning greater responsibility over time are aligned to our culture. So the only way we can fix it is from the bottom up. We make sure that the recruiting pools reflect as much as possible the population where we're recruiting, gender, but also other elements that make us all different from each other. And we really believe that if we bring more women at entry level positions, then obviously more and more of them will rise to the top. It's a very slow journey that we've been on for eight years, but we're finally starting to see the results and the progress. It's much harder than going out and trying to hire a senior female leader and bring her in. That would be great. And if organizations are doing that and it's working for them, I'm not criticizing that. But for us, it's really been grassroots. So I think it starts with acknowledging that perhaps the practices of the past are not working because they've led us to a place where some organizations don't even have one female role model in a leadership role. We, by the way, find that teams led by a woman have immediately an improvement in gender diversity because as a female candidate, you see a role model, you see someone that you can become, you see the promise to move on. But it really starts with acknowledging that there is change needed. And then we, we at least at Hilti, over the last nearly a decade, have taken a series of small steps and have seen very steady progress. Some would like to see it much faster, but I believe that's the right way. Mm. If we just broaden our, our lens uh, at, the at the moment, look at the world that we're all sharing, obviously there's many cultural cues and references about uh, masculinity. And I want to invite you to comment on those. I mean, I, I, could put the, I could put the optimist's case, and the optimist's case would be uh, we've seen recently in uh, the world of politics the rejection of some, you know, sort of hyper-masculine toxic figures. I'm thinking of Bolsonaro, obviously. Uh, <coughs> President Trump's slate of candidates did not go as he would have wished in the midterms. Uh, there seems to be a flurry of books being published about uh, the crisis in masculinity, uh, inviting people to start interrogating different visions of masculinity. So I could put the case there are some cultural cues 
that we are having the right conversation and the right conversation helps lead to change. I could also put the case, Elon Musk, social media, uh, there's a lot around uh, that would lead you to worry uh, that uh, the cultural slipstream that we'll be sharing will be one where uh, there's more shared exchanges that are misogynistic, sexist, racist, and unfortunately the list goes on. I mean, how do you see that, the backdrop against which we're trying to do this very thoughtful work? Yeah, so I, I'm, uh, I see the latter scenario more, right? And you forgot to mention Jordan Peterson, <laughs> the big kind of a hero of uh, the disenchanted and disfranchised uh, um, under threat, toxic masculine, you know, um, man. So, but I think that pushback and that fight um, is a sign that there has been some progress, right? I think 20 or 30 years ago, there wasn't even that. And now there is kind of this debate and there is, obviously it also leads to kind of um, the filter bubbles and the echo chambers, etc. And I don't think we're necessarily talking to each other that much. Um, the other thing I would say is that I think historically, or at least the first um, recent modern wave of feminism, sort of 60s, 70s, really focused a lot on uh, gender neutrality and, um, you know, uh, on negating or minimizing gender differences in pretty much anything. Um, and I, and I don't, I'm not aligned to that, right? I think there are um, gender differences in masculinity and femininity. I see masculinity and femininity as two continuous variables, right? And we all know some biological men who are higher on femininity than some biological women, irrespective of what they identify as and vice versa. And fundamentally what I advocate for is a more feminine style of leadership and management because i think again whoever you are biologically it is generally preferably uh, preferable to have you know higher levels of uh, empathy emotional intelligence kindness uh, to listen rather than to speak um to have self-control humility and, and these are still more feminine than masculine traits Right. Sometimes people get upset as I like, go, oh, why are you calling them that? You know, but because they are, they are culturally associated and socially associated with more feminine traits. Uh, and we know that they would be conducive or beneficial to higher leadership performance, which again, actually uh, would also help men who display these behaviors, these more feminine behaviors to uh, get promoted to where they should be promoted. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I think the backlash is a sign of uh, progress, although of course by um, all statistics and all um, predictions, etc., it's uh, pretty depressing, you know, if we think that it's going to take 110 years to get to gender parity at this rate, so I guess we'll de we're likely to destroy the planet before we get gender <laughs> equality. I don't know if that's good news or bad news, probably <laughs> not, right? But, and if you look at the pictures of the recent COP, you can see they're conflated as well, right? Mm. Okay, hopefully more optimistic intervention. <laughs> <laughs> that was me being an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, I mean, uh, your question had an optimistic side and a pessimistic side. I'm very optimistic by nature, but when it comes to this issue, let me tell you where I draw my optimism to, and it's in two areas, in the business side, but also on the personal side. In the business side, I've been now working for almost two decades, and you know, there's this phenomenon that every generation believes that the generation before them had no clue, and the generation after them is extremely lazy and incompetent. <laughs> and we've heard that fears with millennials and with other generations that will come into the workforce. When I look at this room, when I look at the, the new team members that are joining our organization, we've just added almost 2,000 new team members in the last year. When I look into how they answer our global employee opinion survey, that I referenced before, that's where I draw my optimism for. We're bringing into the workforce 
of people like all of you that are very motivated to fix the issues that you said before where the workplace is not working for all of us. They're choosing the company that they want to work for, not just based on their own career progression and their income and their stability, which of course are important to all of you, I'm sure, but they're really looking to make a difference. And that making a difference is very individual for some people. It has to do with their passion for the environment and making sure the world is still here and that we live, leave a great place for our children and grandchildren to live on. But for many of them, it is about issues of equality and equity. And that gives me a tremendous amount of optimism because these people joining the workforce today will lead organizations in 5, 10, 15 years, however long it takes. So that gives me a tremendous amount of optimism when I also see how they engage with us, the opportunities that they take to engage beyond business and the communities that we, we operate in and that I see their drive to do it. On a personal note, you know, I have two teenage boys. They both go to an international school. We moved to Switzerland. Hilti's headquartered in Liechtenstein. And uh, they go to this international school, and as they meet new friends, I sometimes ask them, where is she or he from? And they typically don't know the answer. And you see, in my generation, that's kind of what you ask, right? Where are you from? What's your nationality? In their world, it is a bit bubbly in an international school in a place like Switzerland, but I find it so fascinating that in their world, that's not so critical. And issues of gender fluidity, for example, which in my generation, we didn't talk about, we didn't understand, are commonplace in their school. And that gives me a lot of optimism that this generation rising this way and coming this way, where where you're from is not even a question you ask or know about a person. You get to know the person based on their own qualities. And if I couple that with the openness that's required to operate in an environment where people sometimes view gender on a scale, on a continuum, and not fixed, that's maybe even the next level that's required to make some of these issues work. So I have to say I'm highly, highly optimistic as long as we stay open and have exactly these type of dialogues. I'm naturally optimistic too, but the stats are, you know, worth paying attention to. Um, I'm going to focus on recruitment and the future of organizations and people entering them, as Avi was mentioning. It is true that younger people want more inclusive leaders, more inclusive organizations. They want to see that there's a de diversity, equity and inclusion um, program happening. What are you doing to make sure other voices are heard, other stories are told, other experiences within the workplace are uncovered? We're not. We're hearing from many more different voices and taking in those intersectional lenses as well. So it's not just diversity on a gender, on the way you express your gender, but also sexuality, religion, age. Um, so many different stories are now being unearthed, and that makes me very excited. And you can see a lot of employee activism as well. You know, making sure that capitalism is a stakeholder capitalism rather than one that is just for shareholder returns. So I'll stop there. But I, um, one other thing I wanted to say is I heard Caroline Creasy talking this weekend, and she sort of modified what um, Martin Luther King said around how the arc of history works. And he said it works typically towards justice. And she said, absolutely correct, but you have to keep pushing. Mm. The activism is really important. You have to engage people from the heart, from the mind, and also make them future focused. So um, one other thing I wanted to share is that um, equity is really important, and I think you've mentioned it today. When we talk to high potential women and men about what got them their promotion in the workplace, our research showed that over 60% of them talked about on-the-job training. This is stuff that you don't have to pay for. And this is not to discount the programs that happen around gender equity. There was. Um, uh, the stat for the people that accounted their promotion for uh, towards programs was about 10%. So you can actually be really intentional about the people you sponsor, men out there in leadership positions. 
it's about sponsoring people that don't look like you. So I'll, I'll stay really focused. I'm, I'm a history and politics graduate, so I was going to go macro and talk about Hegelian dialectics and so on, but I, materialism, but I won't do that. Mm. Uh, next panel. <laughs> next panel. I'm going to come out now for some audience questions. Uh, I think we're probably just asking people to use a big, loud voice. So uh, we might... Oh, there's a mic. Just, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just front row here and then we'll come across to the questions here. Just coming behind you. Thank you. <coughs> Firstly, thank you to the panel. It's been a really interesting evening so far. It's, you know, it's great to see all of you here. I would like to give you a kind of anecdote from my sort of parochial little life. Um, and I'd really like kind of Thomas and Avi to give me like, their thoughts on, on what's going on in this situation. So recently, um, the lock on my door broke, and um, I, I measured it. It's a regular barrel lock, and um, I measured it. It was, you know, five centimetres wide. Googled up replacement barrel lock, screw fix, got myself down there with the stock number, opened the door, and um, I was the only customer to go into the shop. Bell rang above the door. There were three guys behind the counter. One was a manager, had a big manager's badge on. And um, I walked into the shop and I stood there. And all three of the guys shuffled around, either pretended they couldn't see me, <laughs> couldn't see me, or were so fearful of me, because I'm so terrifying, <laughs> that they just wouldn't speak to me. So I stood there like a lemon for a couple of minutes, not really knowing what to do. And then behind me, the door opened and a man walked in. All three of them looked up and said, what can we get you, mate? So I said, excuse me, like, I'm here, are you going to serve me? And they said, sorry, did you want something? <laughs> now, I'd really like Thomas and Avi to let me know, certainly with your psychology background, what were the dynamics there? I'm the customer. They're there to help me. Why couldn't they see me? <laughs> uh, I'll go to uh, Thomas or Avi. Uh, clearly a gap in the market for a, a, a woman-led uh, hardware company. Uh, anybody who's got an entrepreneurial bent, uh, you can take that one with you. Sure. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for sharing that story so openly. I'm very happy it's not a healthy story, and I would really like to believe it wouldn't happen in our organization. On a side note, I can say that um, some of our most successful uh, salespeople are women. So you can imagine in the situation you described, you walked into a shop. Imagine walking into a construction job site as the expert and teaching men how to safely use equipment. I'm very proud of my wife for many reasons. One of them is that when she watched me as a salesperson at Hilti, that's how I started my career, she looked at me and said, I can do that too, and became a very successful salesperson in her own. I don't know why those men were so ignorant, and I don't want to speak for or against them. I'll leave it to Tomas to <laughs> analyze <laughs> their thoughts. I can only tell you, when I watched my wife teach men, it only took five minutes. And when they realized how competent she was, um, how technical she was, and that they had to acknowledge this woman standing in front of me actually knows what she's talking about, and is stronger than me in this issue. They typically have accepted it and then came back to her again. So I would like to think that if in the end they understood you did your research, you measured your opening, you said it was five centimeters, you knew exactly what you needed to. Again, I said before, I'm an optimist. I would love to think that the next time you walked into the shop, you would have a better experience and maybe the next woman coming in, thanks to you, trailblazing the way would have a better experience. That would at least be my hope. Uh, psychology. So, yeah, first of all, I love this format, so keep the stories coming and we'll make the interpretation, which is, uh, <laughs> for me, is <laughs> music to my ears. I mean, I think we can safely conclude or infer that what's going on is sexism. And, you know, uh, 
ordinarily these people would be sent to an unconscious bias training session, but I think the bias is very conscious. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another problem. And look, I, I mean, uh, we have the, w I guess we have a similar uh, setup in my household where my wife is responsible for any DIY task from very simple to very complex. And I am totally inept when it comes to that. And sometimes she sends me to the DIY shop and they come to me and say, yeah, what do you... And for me, it sounds like, you know, foreign... And I have to call her and then put her on the phone with them. But by now they're used to that, right? Um, so I think, look, it's, uh, it's uh, people are used to operating in the environment uh, they operate and... Um, it's going to take time to change, I think, but to me it's no different from people who cross the road when they see somebody from a different color or a different, you know, look walking next to them. They're conscious about it and they're afraid. They're afraid of otherness, not to justify that, but to explain that. I think we should remember that our operating system is, our software is 300,000 years old and for 99.9% .9 of that time, we were definitely not rewarded for exploring diversity or going outside our little in-group. Most likely we will be killed, eaten or beaten, right? Or get some parasites, which we painfully rediscovered or discovered in the last two, three years, right? So to change that and actually expect people to not just tolerate others who look different, but also celebrate and embrace them is a big, big leap and it's going to take some time. We've got, to, oh heavens, we've got lots and lots of questions. Uh, what I'm going to do is just collect up a few, we're not going to be able to answer them all, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll collect up a few here and then get an answer from the panel. So if we could have the mic over, over here to this block over here. So if you can come right round, what we might do is... Yeah, okay, you, you pick up on the industry one, then if you hand the mic forward, please. Uh, as an educator, um, I've been going to a lot of, worked a lot in aspects of equality. 30 years ago, I worked with the women in manual trade, and there were two things that they told me. One was that no matter how, how well the engineer was trained, um, the jobs were given out by the boys at the pub. The other one, which Australians will recognise, are the purple boots. When you go in a construction site, the boots and the uniform are made to fit men, and they're not appropriate for women. So the Australian group started about purple boots. When I researched these two things the other day, because I thought it was important to bring them to the fore, considering that we are moving forward, I hope, couldn't find them on the internet, disappeared, lost the funding. OK, can you, we'd, we'll get your two questions, and then I'll get a, a cognate Hi. response. Yes. Thank you very much. My, um, it's a topic I'm passionate about. I'm doing a PhD on in the legal profession as to why 60... 4% of women solicitors at entry level form two-thirds of the base of the pyramid, mm. get to the top, they are down to 31%. So looking at all of that, all these topic areas are very, very, very relevant and uh, exploring some of the things that have been mentioned. I've quoted you in my research, actually. Um, just, just a question for, uh, and industry-wise, I think it isn't Specific. Some are more male-dominated than others, but it is it is something that prevails majority uh, of. And I think the culture, the historical background of the profession, has a huge impact as to how the perceptions are. But a question for Avi in particular. Uh, uh, right at the beginning, you talked about the fact that Healthy Group is doing compliance, which intimates that there is an imposition of some sort of standards. Just the conversations as to who imposed those, what were the conversations by way of the driving forces? Is it moralistic issues? Is it business a case? Is it a mixture of everything? And at what level these conversations took place, please? Thank you. And if you could just hand the mic there. Thank you. Yes, please. We'll take your question too and we'll get a combined response. Well, thank you all. Very insightful. And I feel very compelled to like I say, do my, continue to do my part. I've got a website called Men Talk Feminism, and it would be great if the two of you could leave an entry, because <laughs> it is about men advocating feminism and why men should engage with feminism. Um, my question is that, I, having read Laura Bates' Men Who Hate Women, 
I'm, I find it very concerning and scary how there are lots of groups out there recruiting, especially young, vulnerable men into sexism, misogynistic groups, and how misogyny is a gateway drug into right-wing extremism, etc. So back to the um, topic of age, I've read, intuitively I can believe how younger men might have more of an access to feminism, um, etc. But I've also read statistics that say that it's actually the younger men who reject feminism more. And I'm not sure actually to what degree that is true, and I was wondering if you have any more clarity on that. Sure, thank you. Well, Avi, do you want to um, perhaps respond first to the very specific question around the compliance? Um, sure. It I can, uh, I see there are many questions, so I'll try to be very brief. I can also come to your industry question. I think it's an excellent one. In, uh, at Hilti, we provide our team members with uh, team gear so that they're visible out on job sites, and we realized that our team gear was designed for men, and specifically women uh, of different shapes and sizes, women that were going through pregnancies. We changed that. We also see that alliances we are part of with our customers in construction that suffer tremendously from a lack of skilled labor and are actually forced to expand their recruiting pools, including into women, are more open. I'd love to learn more about the Boots example because I see many of our customers adjusting their practices, including the safety gear they provide to make them uh, more usable for women. To your compliance question, as I said, my personal journey started when the company said that as part of our strategy that was uh, designed for the year 2020, seems like a long time ago, was at the end of 2014, talked about being a high-performing global team, and we wanted to focus on our global diversity, on our gender diversity, and on our generational diversity. And I chose the word compliance because as a corporate hire, your job is to comply with the company's strategy, and that's how the personal journey started for me. That's why I believe tackling fear, tackling ignorance, tackling also bias issues is so impactful because that compliance only took me and with that the organization so far. You're not going to really put yourself out there. You're not going to be as passionate if you're coming from a compliance point of view. I think if you really believe, which I personally do, that it will allow us to win. I love that Canada and Australia issue. We operate in a competitive environment in every single market that we're in. I really believe that the more women we have in the company in all levels, the more successful we'll be. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for me, gender in the workplace is not a compliance issue anymore. And would either or both of you like to say something about the sort of gateway drug misogyny right-wing recruitment where the younger men are any data on younger men versus older men? I have a very short answer to that, which is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Catalyst, we work with organisations and companies and corporations worldwide, about 500, so we don't, we don't focus on children. Um, but it's great that International Men's Day this year, the theme is around helping boys and men, so it does start early, um, but we can look at, I, I'll start looking into that. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, I'm not sure there are strong age effects, and, and yes to the gateway and all of that, yes we know, but I think that's part of the fight, right, and we're in a battle and there's, it's bound to sometimes be nasty and uh, aggressive. Um, but I do think that the predictors of uh, sexism or open-mindedness or tolerance or, you know, are um, education, curiosity, um, there is actually a very old psychological scale assessment called an, the authoritarian personality scale, actually developed by Theodore Adorno. So those of you who are in politics will know that. Um, and religiosity. So the less religious you are, the less authoritarian, authoritarian you are, the more curious you are, and the more educated you are, um, the more tolerant and the, more, and the less sexist you are. And I think that Can eclipses... Can you think of a political leader yes. that would, no, not at all. Would, would fail <laughs> yeah, on each yeah, of those? Exactly. Just, just saying. Not at all. Well, that's back to your point, right? I think <laughs> Bolsonaro was still fighting back, and I think Trump might still return on 24, so I think the scenario is still bleak, but anyway. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to just take two questions over here. 
I know, oh, oh God, take two questions here and one question here, and then I haven't discriminated completely against that side of the room, and then we're going to have to go. So I'll take the, uh, at the back, with the green scarf. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, my name is Joy Burnford. I've just published a book last week actually called Don't Fix Women. So I was delighted to hear of the wonderful comments from the panel today. I'd like to um, just raise the, the point about um, men in the home, because I think this is such an important thing we need to do more of. And enabling men to work at home will enable women to do more work. The challenge organisations have is that if, if an organisation lets all their their male employees do more work from home and, and more flexible working. It's not benefiting that organisation, it's more of a macro challenge. So, so the, the question really is to, to Julia, to Thomas, um, about more of the macro thing. You know, what kind of things can we help organisations with to try and think bigger about the impact of enabling their male employees to work um, more flexibly and support their women in their lives if it's not necessarily benefiting them as an organisation? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take the two, two men here. Thank you. Uh, We've got the mic coming round for you quickly. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Ewan McGahey, Law School, King's College London. Um, thanks to the panel for a great discussion. Uh, we've had um, 50 years since the Equal Pay Act in the United Kingdom, um, and of course we're still talking about the gender pay gap. And one of the big areas that's been mentioned a few times tonight is that we've still got systemic sex discrimination in childcare. Uh, so women are taking much more time uh, in childcare, uh, men have uh, in the UK two weeks paternity leave, uh, and of course that, that that might sound sort of like it's good for women. Women are getting more leave, but of course the childcare responsibilities and burdens are, are very unequally shared. Um, and, and, and we know that the gender pay gap grows a lot more uh, from about age 30 in the UK. So when childcare uh, becomes an important thing, um, and there's a, a large group of companies now that are offering uh, equal. Uh, childcare leave, 26 weeks each, um, Aviva, Standard Life, Diageo. Uh, we also know, just uh, one more note, is that in Sweden, uh, when childcare is shared, parents have a free choice to share. Um, men take about a third of the time, women take about two thirds, because when there's private choice, the social stereotypes are perpetuated. Um, so, uh, would the panel agree, and, and perhaps would everybody here agree, uh, at King's College London, staff want to have uh, raising and equalising of parental leave to 26 weeks for everyone uh, on full pay. J just hands up. Uh, who thinks that might be a good idea? <laughs> okay, great. Well done. So we might we might take that to uh, the, the King's College management meetings. Uh, and then uh, my question for the for the panel is: uh, I, I didn't see Hilti or Catalyst or Manpower Group on the list of. Uh, companies offering 26 weeks <laughs> pay parental leave. Uh, I, I, are you going to do that soon? Okay. And just pass, if you could pass the mic forward, please. Well, that was basically going to be my question. Yeah, something similar, <laughs> but I'll, I'll just pick up something else that um, Abby said at the beginning about how you weren't aware of women's experience until it was sort of brought to your attention. And I just wonder, you know, we're all surrounded by women as men. Why do you have to have it drawn to your attention? Not you personally, but why do we... Um, why are we not noticing it? Why are we having to have it drawn to our attention when uh, the women around us are suffering um, all the things that we know they are? So, you know, what's going on with, with masculinity and men around that? And I'm just going to take a last question here. Can you just do it in a very big yes. voice? Of course I can. Uh, of course you can. Um, my question was to Abby directly, and I think it's been kind of asked, a bit more convoluted already. What has, you mentioned parental leave and noticing you have to be more competitive Paternity leave and your paternity leave a while ago. Uh, my question was very direct. Are they equal now for men as well as women? Okay. Um, and following on to the panel, actually, for all of those in the audience who manage at this point, whether that's in profit or not for profit, um, what would your parting words be in terms of how can all of us? Health equality. I see differences in my team on an age gap. When we talk about equality and perception thereof, but what can we do to equalise everybody? Okay, thank you. So the, those questions are happily on sort of a bit of a theme about uh, childcare, paternity leave, virtual work, uh, equalising entitlements. So I'm going to 
ask you for any reflections on that and also just ask for your, you know, this is, we're in the halls of an academic institution, so you should expect there to be homework. Uh, if you had, uh, if you had one sentence worth of go home and do X, uh, you don't have to do it in your home, take with you, um, take with you the following message and go and do it, what would it be? So, Thomas, do you want so to... So, obviously, buy my book, is available on Amazon, <laughs> and uh, that's the easiest question of the evening. Thank you for that. Um, no, and then I want to I wanna, uh, uh, answer on the theme. I mean, all these things are really important, right? And if we know, and even the gentleman who talked about what happens in Sweden when it can split, I think, I believe, because of that, Norway and maybe Iceland force people to take it, right? So the father and the mother have to take it, and it addresses that. All of these things, which we haven't really focused about because we're talking about cognitive biases or misconceptions, or make a big difference just like um you know quotas make a difference even though they're illegal in certain countries right but if your objective is to actually get to 30 percent or 40 percent or 50 percent it's not that difficult mm -hmm. you just appoint that percentage of women and make sure that they're not handicapped when they're there and create favorable conditions so so although i think the last round uh, i'm glad it came up because it's really really um it makes a big difference okay and the homework is by the book uh yeah. <laughs> please I, uh, I appreciate all those questions and I'm happy to stay and, and answer them more. For the sake of time, I would say we aim to be a great place to work for everyone everywhere. So in every market where we operate, we always want to have a competitive benefits package. What I've observed, it's much more important to create an environment where men and women feel that they can take advantage of our flexible work arrangements and work from home, that they can take paternity leave, that they can take our... We have a very generous sabbatical policy where you can take months off from work for whatever purpose you deem necessary. It has nothing to do with expanding your family. My personal experience has been you can create policies, you can ensure they're equal, and I fully agree with that, but creating the environment where people feel encouraged and welcome to take it is much more important. And of course, as a global company, our policies are different between countries. I don't want to ignore your question on it's around us. I think that's true. I can only speak for myself and the group of people. It was actually a fairly large uh, mark group that I went that had a majority men, as, as was nicely explained. I think we know these issues are out there. We know that women, for example, can walk down the street and have an inappropriate comment made to them. We know that women perhaps would feel less safe in business travel we know those issues exist, but I think the way the workshop is organized and orchestrated, especially when you have an effective moderator, which I benefited from, you're really confronted with that issue and you're really faced, if you're a reflective person, to then ask yourself, why is it like that and what can I do to change it? So if I would give you a, a homework or something to do, I really do believe in the Catalyst mission. It's a wonderful organization. Perhaps Mark is not for everybody, but I will say the women that participate by having the courage to be there and to engage in these dialogues, they make the workshop happen because if it's a group of men, the workshop is highly ineffective. So I would really encourage you to look for those opportunities. Obviously, after the pandemic, it's now also available online, which makes it much easier. That would be my homework because it really changed my outlook on the topic. And with that, we have been able to bring along countless executives in our company at Hilti. And it really does change the world one person at a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. That was a great summary. I think that I'll say two things for the sake of time. So the first thing is definitely go to the Catalyst website. We've got a lot of resources, tools, and research that you can have a look at. A lot is freely available as well. Um, the second thing to think about as you go away is that I think some research was done earlier this year commissioned by Sir Robert McAlpine and um, Mother Pucker, who uh, advocate and campaign for flexible working, and they and the outcome of that research was that 37 billion would be added to the UK economy if more people did flexible working. So um, that's something we should all be thinking about and pushing for in the workplace as well. Thank you.
Well, a very big uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining in this conversation and for those on the live stream. Uh, we are going to have to bring it to an end. We're slightly over time, but please do feel free to stay and circulate and ask questions of the panel. Uh, but can I ask you now to join me in thanking the panel for what I think has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. big thank you too to Professor Rosie Campbell and to the Global Institute for Women's Leadership team who have made this event possible. Thank you for all of your hard work uh, and good evening. Please do stay and thank you to those who joined us online. Thank you very much.